Today's episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Benjamin Opdyke. Benjamin Opdyke would like to thank the nuisances that builders and homeowners despise. Our premium products protect from those pesky things like rain, snow, UV rays, and the neighbor's sprinkler system. Take Hydrogap SA, the first self-adhered drainable house wrap that combines a true air barrier and drainage gap. Or Invisirap UV, an all-black WRB, perfect for long-term moisture protection behind open joint siding. Backed by an unmatched 25-year warranty, Benjamin Opdyke's UV-protected rain screen system not only features Invisirap UV, but HydroFlash UV+, a high-performance vapor permeable flashing tape. Visit BenjaminOpdyke.com to learn more about their comprehensive, durable systems. power for at least another 10 years while the life of the PV holds up. Do you have any response to folks who uh, object to the aesthetics of PV panels on their roof? Yeah, they're ugly as hell, but you know, what, <laughs> what, what are you going to do? <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by professional estimator, builder, home builder, his own home builder, Ian Schwant. How are you doing, Patrick? <laughs> uh, fine Home Building Video Director, Colin Russell. Hi. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Howdy. You can find the previous previous Fine Home Building podcast and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. And you can email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Well, it is a pleasure to see you guys this morning. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, good morning. Colin, it's been a while since you've been on the program. What have you been doing at uh, your place? Last we checked in, you were working on a, a bathroom. <laughs> Isn't that always the case with me? And it's always the same bathroom. Um, so, you know, as a weekend warrior and some weekends, you know, I'm visiting colleges perhaps, so I'm not always working on it. But I finally got to my built-ins, which was, you know, um, I guess you'd call it a custom closet slash vanity because it sort of fills in an L and to gain as much storage as I could. And it's um, uh, your vanity is... Uh, has a vessel sink on top, right? Yeah, semi vessel. So it's it's actually proud three and a half inches. But I did. It is like I have a, a, a traditional cutout. But it's bigger countertop. than like a you know a salad bowl like you often see in folks' oh. powder rooms, right? Yeah, no, it's a legit <laughs> sink. Yeah, um, and the idea is because I also have a, a, a cherry countertop underneath. You know, so I'm putting wood in a wet area. So I I wanted to make sure the sink was substantial. Did you make that countertop? It's beautiful. It's all I beautiful. Did, I did not. I mean, it's uh, cherry countertops are a theme through my house, my uh. little house. And um, the last one I did was so long. It was over eight feet long. So I made that one myself, like with the big glue up. And then um, I happened across that Lowe's stocks, these butcher block cherry countertops. So I was like, this is kind of worth it to me. It sounds like pretty fast, you know? Yeah. So and I bet you couldn't make it as cheap as they sold it to you for. Oh yeah. I, I forget. I think mine was essentially two feet by four feet. So I did have to cut it down, but, um, yeah, it, it was under $300 mm. and you know, it was just ready. So the, what I needed to do was finish it nicely. Right. And that can be a challenge. Um, People, you know, I've, I always feel like if I make something nice, I ruin it with paint or some kind of finish. So <laughs> in this case, the, the challenge for me was that, you know, uh, so I, I, I remembered the lessons I learned from Peter Getrys, uh, you know. On how to finish it? On how to finish. He finished a, a wood door for us, mm. you know, for, on a, a video, an article years back. But like, it's funny how with my job, it's like when I go to pursue a task, you know, or a project, all these memories start coming back and here, you know, Peter's like, you know, the, the foam brush isn't putting bubbles into your surface. You are because I, I bubbled the <laughs> heck out of it. I had to sand it off, you know, a couple of times. Um, but I finally figured it out and I got a glass like finish with just, yeah. 
I do. Do you find it uh, challenging to work for fine home building sometimes in in the like uh, quality of work we have to do owing to the people who taught us? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yes, to some degree. And like, for example, I've been in contact with Tyler Grace, who just finished a built-in. And it's very similar in style to what I was doing. But when he showed me, he's like, oh, let me send you a picture of how it looks. I was completely put to shame. You know, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> completely. And, you know, because... Uh, and, and I sent him a picture of what I'm doing, and he said something like, quality can really only be judged by, like, how much time you have to put into something, right? Because if you're a weekend warrior, you're like, look, I got to get this sink in by, yeah. you know, I Sunday need a bathroom. night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's, anyway, so. Well, are you happy? I mean, is it work coming out the way you want? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you know, for me, as since I do site built cabinetry, I guess, you know, right now is not a great time for me to be outside making the door. So no, because it's one, <laughs> it, it's one. And it's, then there's a foot of snow. And uh, so uh, so making making the closet door and the doors on the cabinets next. But yeah, you'll no, be, I'm happy. Yeah, you'll be amazed at how long that takes. I, I mean, oh. recently had to make a cabinet door, and it's staggeringly uh, I, surprising. Yeah, I haven't decided on the method I'm going to use yet. You know, uh, I've seen several different ones. Um, I think you need to buy a domino and do some loose tenon joinery, right, Ian? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, buy a domino or <laughs> yeah, no, can you no, rent buy one? Because, you know, I buy don't... the big one, too. Oh, right. 1700 bucks. Oh, yeah. It's just you money. Go. Just think um, what you'd pay a cabinet maker to make that cabinet. I think you're paying, it's paying for itself practically, right? Yeah. I mean, I, that's yeah. what I told my wife when I bought one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to do there, but, um, you know, in the past, I've just done my own version with uh, the Craig jigs and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So, pocket joints. How about you, Ian? Did you get your uh, floor registers recessed into your hardwood floor? I did, yeah. I got the, the Festool router and the vacuum out and did a nice clean job of it. And, did you do it freehand or did you make a jig to guide it? I freehanded it. Yeah. I, I just went around the, uh, the round vent cover with the marking knife and filled it in with a little bit of pencil lead and just freehanded it. Looks That's fine. pretty gutsy. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> Roll the dice. It's just, it's just flooring. I got a little bit more of it. If it really looked bad. What else do you got to do now? I'm sure your punch list is still probably a couple pages. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I've got to get back to the kitchen. Uh, some shelving that was meant to be put up. And, you know, we still have the IKEA cabinet doors and no real drawers for storage. So I've got to get after that. And same with the closet. So I think I need to get the the garage insulated to where I can heat it a little bit and, and then get the shop set up out there. But I also had to do some stuff for my parents, I had to change out the faucet in their kitchen, uh, which I think we built that house in maybe 2003 or 2004. So uh, doing that, I was thinking about that article that you had sent about older homes and needing to do maintenance to keep up on it. And Oh, started boy. seeing all the, the future little projects that I'm going to get calls from my parents. On. I can't wait to get out the <laughs> gas and matches to have that conversation. Uh, yeah, so uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is I find it very difficult to find good-looking, reasonably priced light fixtures. What, what did you do in that regard? We went on uh, just a whole bunch of different websites and bought stuff, sent stuff back, and... Uh, Luckily, from doing work, you know, remodeling work, you get to see a lot of different light fixtures that people yeah. buy. So you can you can kind of start to pick out you know, which styles you like. And uh, I'm guessing your clients' fixtures are stupidly expensive, though, right? I mean, a lot of them are. Yeah, yeah. hundreds. Yeah, and some of them are even custom made. So I it's think a, it's trial and error. Buy them from somewhere you can send them back to. Um, and what were the uh, places that you ended up buying fixtures from? Uh, I got all of them from some offshoot of build.com. I can't oh. remember the, the exact name of the website, but it's, it's a total clone of build.com. 
and it's uh, just light fixtures, or did they sell other yeah, stuff too? It yeah. was just light fixtures. Uh, I would suspect you can get to it through Build.com, or it's probably one of the ones that comes up. But we did order uh, these like articulating arm sconces for our bar area and the area around our range. And when the electrician put them up and then you know flipped the lights, and three of the four came on. And I was like, oh, well, one of them must be dead. So I ordered another one and the electrician swapped it out and that one was dead too. And in reaching up there to, to look at it, I found that there was a little twist knob on top of the, the shade <laughs> that I didn't realize was there. And I just flicked it and uh, yeah, it worked. So um, we have five of those now. What is it about people who are handy, like never think of the simple thing first, right? It's just always this like, uh, you know, systematic, systemic problem, right? Yeah, well, Sarah was like, hey, Justin, the electrician, didn't think of it either. So don't beat yourself up too much. <laughs> Are you a direction reader or do you like plow ahead because you know better anyway? I have to force myself to read directions. Yeah. Uh, it, it's been a ongoing uh, battle of mine my whole life. I have to really force myself to. Otherwise, I would just throw them out and figure, I'll figure it out. Oh, yeah, I mean, but it never, never goes well. If you've put up a few light fixtures, it starts to make sense to you, but some of them are really baffling and some of them have like multiple pieces because they have to be multiple, multiple ways of mounting them, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I bought a modern heat vent cover because I don't like the ways ours look and it, it, there is absolutely no way to install this thing. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's just not. So, you know, I can, I'm going to glue it in place, but uh <laughs> It comes with four screws. Try putting them somewhere. <laughs> I have more. I, th I think registers are fraught with peril. Like, oh, yeah. uh, there's just those little tabs that you're supposed to put a sheet metal screw in. And if somebody gets a little cockeyed or whatever, it's it's never easy. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of the dampers that I ordered for my HRV ducts. And when I got them and got the covers that were supposed to go with them, it was like Colin said, there was absolutely no way that system was going to work. <laughs> I mean, if I could happen to get like a screw gun or even a driver to get the screws in because they're supposed to go like this, they'd be going into drywall. Right. Yeah. So, know. you know, yeah, you know. I Yeah. In other words, you need to do a little bit of special framing or blocking. Yep. You know. Or hollow wall anchors can get you out of a jam if you're trying to get the client moved in there tomorrow or, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. less than perfect because someone's going to hit it with a vacuum cleaner or whatever and knock well, it off the wall. I'm, I'm going to just get it right the first time and glue it in place permanently. There you go. There you go. Because Construction adhesive is known to solve many problems. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Jeff, what's been going on at your place? You got like a foot of snow, right? Uh, we only, I don't know, six, eight inches, not that much. And it yeah, was us too. Really light powder. But, you know, again, Plow took out my mailbox. Just Again? Again, yep. <laughs> so I, Did you I piss off they... the town? Did you show up at a council meeting or something and <laughs> <laughs> make a scene? <laughs> I, I did not. I have not. Not, not that I'm aware of. But uh, I think they just got new plows that have a, a bigger overhang at the top. Because they're hitting the they're they're hitting the, the mailbox. They're not. It's not the snow because they're denting it. So I pounded they're, it out and remounted it. What are you doing? The ground is it. frozen, and you got to did it break off the post or just take? Yeah, off no, the... it just rips it off the post. Okay, well that's not as bad. Patrick, or, when you get your welder that Dak told you to buy, I think you need to like <laughs> weld up out of like thick steel some giant uh, mailbox for Jeff. And then we'll like put a cage around it for you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's what I want to do is like, you know, build a like a, a uh, you know, parking lot. Ball yeah, bollards right next to yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least if he hits it, he's going to lose the plow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw all kinds of innovative ways to keep from losing your mailbox in, you know, in northern Vermont, right? Like folks would put them on a on a uh, a swinging arm, yeah. right? So it yeah. would, or a spring, or they would just like toss it in the snowbank and <laughs> not worry about it. What have you been working on, Patrick? Nothing. I I like took the weekend <laughs> off. All um, right. I watched a bunch of YouTube videos, and uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that, but. One of the things I did was uh, look at Facebook a lot, and uh, one of the things that came up 
was a conversation from my Facebook friends about fixing stuff in hotel rooms uh, because it drives you bananas or in the doctor's office or, you know, you go to this restaurant and the people treat you really nice and you, you know, put the doorknob back on or whatever it is. D do you guys find yourself doing this? It made me laugh hilar out loud. It was so funny. Hmm. You're like, no, I'm not That's fixing anything. That's a hard anything. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, do you guys travel with tools like a, a Swiss Army knife or a Leatherman or whatever with you at all times? Like, do you guys have have these things? What about you, Jeff? Do you have a, a, a multi tool or something on your in your pocket? Um, I, I usually have a, a little pocket knife and a little Swiss Army knife, but not, and, not and do you too find much. yourself using them daily? Um, I mean, when I'm traveling, yeah, or, um, pretty much, yeah. So, so wind up doing something. I mean, I used to. I mean, back in the old days of tube televisions, I would walk into bars and tweak their TVs because they'd drive me crazy. <laughs> I could think that would be a good way to start a fight. Hey, what's that guy messing with our TV? <laughs> Ian, you're saying no. You're like, no, I, it doesn't hard, bother me. That's a hard no. I, I let it slide. But I, I do keep tools in, in all of our vehicles for, you know, when we are somewhere and somebody does ask you to fix a, a doorknob or I'll do it like at a friend's house. I like to do that after you've been sitting around having a few beers going around their house and like fixing, fixing. all their doorknobs <laughs> and cabinet doors. I'll do that. Just You can make them yeah. feel really bad when you're drunk. I can do this yeah. drunk. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It kind of becomes a, like a cartoon. So what is your toolkit in your car? Because that I am interested. Like I, I don't want to waste a lot of space, but you, you need to be handy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, both the toolboxes are like a small uh, shoebox style sized uh, metal one and, uh, you know, five in one screwdriver type thing, uh, basic set of wrenches, razor blades, little hammer, tape measure, that kind of stuff. It, it can get you a long, long way. Yeah, that, that, you know, it's funny. I don't carry any of that stuff, and it would drive me bananas if I was by the side of the road that was something easily fixed, and I just yeah. didn't have the, the tools that would drive me crazy. So our friend Ben Bogey told me that, that you can actually get one of these uh, Vera tool check kits through security, which I found very surprising. He said, but the TSA agent uh, opened it up and was, quote, looking for something pokey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, got, I got on to – I went through a Swiss Air – and the newer security with a um, you, a multi tool and like and two of the tools on it were knives. <laughs> and they didn't see it, or you checked I, it, or I don't know. It was just in my bag, and no one asked to look at it. So I think it's know. okay if you check it, right? Well, so this was carry on. Oh wow! So I, I'm guessing mm -hmm. they just didn't see it. Yeah, I no. wasn't trying to sneak anything. I was like, right. It was a tool. I mean, there's a tool I was traveling with, but I need it for my gear. It seems like a videographer needs like some basic tools to oh, fix yeah. stuff. Yeah, certainly. Sure. Well, I thought it was a fun conversation, and it was yeah. hilarious to hear about folks who uh, fix things in hotel rooms and make friends with the the, the staff. And you know, when they go back later, they get upgraded, and it's it's kind of cool. So you alluded to it earlier, Ian, about uh, our next question, and uh, it's a question I had because um, someone linked a. Uh, Atlantic article, and um, I, I want to read a little bit about it here. Okay, here we go. This is from uh, Mr. Nolan Gray, is a professional city planner and housing researcher at US, UCLA. He's the author of uh, Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. All right, so I'm not going to read all this, but I'm going to read some excerpts for this book. Um, his, his article is titled, Noisy and Unsafe, Stop Fetishizing Old Houses. Um, across the country, but particularly along the coast, barriers to construction mean that housing production has plummeted so that we now face a demand supply gap of 6.8 million homes. To break even over the next 10 years, the National Association of Realtors found we would need to build at least 700,000 new homes each year. In the meantime, we're stuck with a lot of old housing that, to put it bluntly, just kind of sucks. 
A stately Victorian manor in the Berkshires is one thing, but if you live in a Boston triple-decker or a kit-built San Jose bungalow or a Chicago Greystone, your home is the cheap housing of generations past. These structures were built to last half a century at most with diligent maintenance, at which point the developers understood that they would require substantial rehabilitation. Generally speaking, however, the maintenance hasn't been diligent, the rehabilitation hasn't been forthcoming, and any form of redevelopment is illegal thanks to overzealous zoning. Modern homes and apartment buildings are not only far better insulated, they also feature modern HVAC technology such that homes can be warmed and cooled without using nearly as much energy as their older counterparts. Given that heating and cooling account for nearly half of all household energy use in the U.S., the savings from new housing could have serious implications for climate change. The little space heater struggling to keep your drafty old apartment warm to say nothing of your window AC unit isn't just unsightly, it's also a climate failure. You might think uneven floors or steep stairways have character. You'll get no argument here, but more often than not, old housing is simply less safe. Until 1978, lead was common in house paint and until 1980s in water pipes. Although the substance has been banned in new housing, the CDC estimates that 24 million old homes are still coated in lead paint, while an estimated 9.2 million homes still receive water through lead pipes. Or take fire safety. Electrical fires account for nearly 1 in 10 residential fires, killing nearly 500 Americans each year. These fires are mostly a function of improper and aging wiring, which is endemic in older homes. Worse yet, many older homes lack the materials needed to stop a blaze once it starts. Back in 2016, a single misplaced cigarette might have been what sent San Francisco's Greywood Hotel, a 116-year-old single-room occupancy building housing approximately 77 people, went up in flames. Even when housing, old housing is not killing its occupants, much of it is, is exclusionary by design. Before the passage of Americans with Disabilities Act and recent amendments to the Fair Housing Act, standard elements such as ramps and elevators, as well as more subtle accessibility features such as automatic doors and wheelchair-friendly units were not required and so were rarely provided. As a result, old housing Topologies like New York City's walk-up tenements end up trapping thousands of seniors in place while limiting housing opportunities for many thousands more. Whoa, what do you guys think? I, I had to immediately Google the, the writer because I was certain that M. Nolan Gray was a pen name of Matt Milham after <laughs> reading the article. Uh, just with some of the sentiments about old housing, I, I was shocked to find that Matt didn't write this article. Is he right? I think he's partially right. Uh, but it's, I know that my opinions of old homes are unpopular, just like Matt's. What, what is your opinion? Uh, homes a, a, lot of, a lot of them are energy pigs that would take even more energy to, to square away. So I, I'm an advocate of trying to figure out a way to start recycling some of these old homes, especially the, the smaller you know, GI homes that were built in the 50s and 60s. And like you said in the full article, were really never meant to last as, as long as they have. And they were only meant to last in maybe 50 years with, I think he referred to it as diligent maintenance, which when you drive through the neighborhoods where most of these homes are, you know, most of them are in desperate need of every uh, type I, of I don't maintenance. think that's fair to say because like I've been to places and New York on Long Island is one of them where these these homes have become much bigger. They're very sure. expensive now. Uh, and there's ones in, in my hometown that, that were built in that era. And then they've been well maintained and are still uh, making their owners money when they sell them. True. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I think some of the, the energy stuff uh, is, is tough to straighten these homes out. I mean, even Dan Colbert talks about jokingly wanting to do a shallow energy fit uh, retrofit instead of a deep energy retrofit because of the, the costs and even the carbon footprint involved in bringing some of these structures up to snuff. So Jeff, do you think as opposed to a retrofit, though, are you thinking, like, is there a way to take these homes away and, and put a new home? I think in some cases that's that's got to stay on the table. Uh, you know, like Patrick said, there are neighborhoods where these these types of homes have been well maintained, but there's just as many of them where they have not been. But the ones that are well maintained, they're still energy pigs, right? So if Oftentimes, large times, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Jeff, what do you what do you, what do, you about do with them? 
What do you think, Jeff? It, it's a, it's a double edged sword. I mean, it, you know, they require a lot of energy as they are, but they're not going to be replaced likely with, you know, a 1200 foot bungalow. They're going to be a 4,000 square foot behemoth. That's going to use almost as much energy. And, you know, you're going to lose all the embodied energy that's in that original structure. Well, that's the part I immediately reacted to is like how how green is like demolishing a bunch of housing and then building new housing. I mean, is, does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's like my 22 year old Honda. Is that more energy <laughs> than a brand new Tesla or? Right. Yeah. And you, the, the energy uh, embodied energy is already there. I mean, excepting for the new parts you buy for it. It's it's that that has been spent. Yeah. What what do you think, Colin? Um. I think I'm, I think it, it's a case by case basis, but I kind of like the scrape and go new. I mean, if you like, how, how far do you want to look to the future? Right. So, you know, thinking that some of those houses were designed to be built for 50 years, let's say, well, let's say you did replace it with a new house. How far are you looking into the future with that? You know, it's always odd to me that you spend all this time and money building a new house and the windows are guaranteed for 30 years. <laughs> so when you buy a 30 year old house, like, are you already in a situation where the windows are not functioning like they're supposed to? I, I don't know. I, I guess there's just so many questions. Um, but the idea that the ones that are really like out of whack, it probably makes sense to knock them down. Whereas if something's kind of square or that you could retrofit, is that what you're getting at Ian? That a, a little bit, yeah. I think, like you said, it's got to be a case-by-case -case basis. And then when you also talk about housing densities and the way that zoning, which is one of the other things that Nolan Gray writes about, uh, sort of artificially caps the uh, population density of certain areas that need more places for people to live. Uh, here in Madison, we're seeing it frequently where developers are knocking down entire blocks and putting up, you know, six or eight story buildings with apartments and condos and commercial spaces on the first floor and increasing the overall density in the neighborhood. And that uh, gets a lot of people upset. I mean, sure does. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but to your other to Jeff's point. Yeah, you know, there's just as many of them where people buy three of them, you know, and, and three lots in a row and knock them down and do put up some 5,000 square foot, you know, modernist uh, big home uh, yeah. where there used to be three little uh, more fitting to the neighborhood style structures. That's another point that kind of bugged me is like, you know, we have a, a vast a uh, number of different kinds of housing styles in this country. And I like going different places and seeing vernacular architecture. Uh, I think that is one of the things you definitely lose when you have redevelopment. It's about the bottom line. It's about maximizing square footage. It's not about architectural details that work for the respective climate. And I, I, I think that would be a loss. Yeah, I agree with that. I, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed when I lived in the Northeast was just the, the amount of diversity of the housing stock throughout the whole area. Uh, but I think when you're talking about these big picture things like energy and carbon footprint, you can't just automatically take things off the table because uh, you're emotionally attached to an old home. Well, I uh, hope our listeners will weigh in on this subject because you it think? is a. I, <laughs> it, it is I'm sure a, I wound up a few people with what I said. Well, uh, what you said has surprised me a little, but I mean, I think we all agree that uh, drafty old homes are not pleasant to live in. Um, but I don't know that tearing them down and building new ones is is the right way to go. But they're not easy to fix. And no. oftentimes, the, like you suggest, the fix is more expensive than the house is worth. Yeah. So uh, let's get to some feedback. I know I mixed up things today here, but <laughs> it's, it's all right. Uh, this comes from Doug. Hi, all. In 426, you asked for electrical questions for an upcoming pro talk. I'd like Rick's opinion on the requirement for arc fault circuit breakers on every circuit. When I built our new house 10 years ago, I only needed them for bedrooms. 
My observation at the time was that the $4 breaker became a $30 one. My cynical side wondered if the requirement was pushed by Square D and others for profit. I have since learned that they have a tendency to trip when the power re is restored after an outage. This is an irritant, but not the end of the world. Now they are required everywhere. They're, it is a greater concern. I know of people who have lost a freezer full of food because they were out of town during one of these events. It was winter and one of the breakers controls your heat and you could return to frozen pipes. For this reason, I know, know someone who after, getting the CO, uh, who after getting the CO replaced these breakers with standard ones. Sometimes there are unintended consequences to code change. So uh, I asked, uh, he says, as to Rick's comment, Rick Haverhill, who wrote into the podcast a couple weeks ago, about 20 amp circuits, while people are adding more devices, the total load is not necessarily greater. All the new must-have kitchen toys are already on 20 amp circuits. Keep the, up the info and fun. He's saying, well, that like all the uh, hydro uh, gadgets that people now have are already, they're kitchen appliances and there are already 20 amp circuits required in your kitchen. So I asked Rick about the uh, arc fault breakers. Have you had any trouble with these, Ian? I'm not a fan. I haven't had any problems with them yet, but it's definitely on my radar now after seeing the amount of uh, writing on Google when I when I searched the arc fault breaker tripping. Problems. So this is a real thing. You you, oh, you yeah, agree? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot lot of stuff out there about it, and a lot of people who did what uh, Doug talked about with taking them out after you get your CO and putting in regular ones. Now, are we talking about? The arc faults at the outlet versus doing it in the box. It's the box. Like it's it, it's box. a breaker. Yeah. It's a breaker. And, yeah. Yeah. And okay. I don't I don't know if you can use receptacles. Can you, Ian? Do you know? I don't believe so. It, wow. Um. So uh, I asked Rick Haverhill about this, and he said, Patrick, I spoke with my local Square D rep. He told me that the first generation of arc fault detector breakers did have issues along the lines of what Doug was describing. He told of one case recently where the utility transformer on the pole had some grounding issues that were causing the arc fault breakers to trip inside houses during a restoration of power after an outage. But he said that was pretty easy to find because it was a newer development where all the, all the houses had arc fault breakers. So they knew if they were all having this trouble that it was uh, utility driven, not all these houses wouldn't have individual problems at the same time. He says, if the homeowner is having trouble with his arc fault breakers tripping, I would be hesitant to replace them with standard breakers right away. I would at least speak to the electrician who wired the residents and talk to them to see if they would be willing to replace the suspect arc fault with another one and see if the problem continues. The Square D rep did say that some batches of uh, arc fault breakers were recalled by the factory. Replacing the arc fault breaker with a classic breaker immediately without giving your electrician a chance to try to narrow down the problem may be a quick fix, but doesn't help find the root cause, uh, which would be an arc fault, <laughs> which can start a fire. So, you know, it's a risk to just summarily swap that out. What, Colin? You, you don't want these, do you? Oh, well, I, listen, if they work, I don't mind. I, I get the, like, freezer, like, full of food, right? That that's a problem. <laughs> that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, or your heat going out, also a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Have you had any trouble? Do you have these in your house, Jeff? I bet you don't. Your no. house is, what, 2,000 or yeah. thereabouts? Yeah. Uh, I think these date to the early aughts, right? Uh, and they were first only required in bedrooms. This comes from Alex. Hi, Patrick and gang. I had to weigh in on a few items from episode 426. UL stands for Underwriters Laboratory, created by the fire insurance providers to reduce or deny claims. Many loans and construction specifications require all building products to be UL listed for their intended use. Note that UL changed from a nonprofit to an LLC in 2012. Think listing fees. Uh, regarding the discussion of 15 versus 20 amp brand circuits, I agree with Rick that 20 amp circuits are still the way to go, but for a different reason. Everyone was talking about capacity, but not about voltage drop. 14 gauge wire has 60% less ability to resist voltage drop than 12 gauge wire, so you're much more likely to encounter voltage sag issues in homes with 15 amp circuits. 
Uh, Andrew also mentioned panel sizing. 100 amps is probably sufficient for most small homes, but many utilities now have a 200 amp standard. As we work toward decarbonization and electrification, you'll find that EV charging, PV, HVAC, and heat pump water heaters and electric cook cooking add up to quite a bit. And yes, PV can count against your panel sizing. Finally, to heat pump water heaters, I find that everything except eco mode keeps the electric resistance elements on, negating much of the benefit. Here in California, we also uh, tie the airflow into IT closets or a west facing zone, adding some supplemental cooling. I'll tell you about my own house and difficulties finding a quality contractor another time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting the show on. Well, that was good uh, uh, input, but I don't know. Most homes aren't big enough that I think voltage drop is a problem for 14 uh, wire, but I might be wrong about that. Prove me wrong, Alex. Good feedback. Ian, someone wants to know about your uh, moisture meter, right? Yeah. Uh because I made the comment about it being used for non-wood materials like drywall. Uh, so the one that I have is a Wagner Orion 930, which uh, costs about 400 bucks, and it's available Woo! from a wide range of sellers. I think I found it for like 350 from a home inspector supply thing online. And the reason I bought that particular one was we framed most of our house with uh, LSL studs and LVL studs. And I wanted to be able to check the moisture on them before we went ahead and insulated and closed the house up. So I settled on this one because of the uh, different materials that you could put into it for code, code wise so that you could put in OSB for the studs, you could put in uh, the LVL material for those framing members along with the regular wood. Uh, and we, should, mine, we should briefly explain to folks that um, you the, the, you need to either do some math uh, or the moisture meter needs to compensate for the material right. you're trying to check, right? Because yep. I believe it's they have different conductivity uh, yes. and therefore the meter needs to know what you're trying to, to figure out. Right. And one of the things that I like to do is, you know, go through the different woods and see what the difference would be if I was you know, just checking a two by four and then put it in as oak uh, just to see what the difference is. And I think you're right, it is all conductivity because it's a like an electrical pulse that it puts through the pinless ones. Uh, so mine has settings for one by and two by material. So it'll either send the, the pulse about a quarter of an inch in or three quarters of an inch in to try and get to the uh, center of the material. And then mine has, and a couple of the Orion ones have this, it's called a relative uh, moisture setting. So you can tell the, the tool that all you wanna do is get a reading to compare between two spots of the same material. Mm. So you can take it, put it in that mode, go to dry drywall, in the room, get a test reading on that, and then use that as a comparison as you try and find uh, where you may have wet or, or damp. Or, uh, so it, you'd probably go to an interior wall as an example, yeah. right? And then move it yep. to the exterior wall that you think might be wet. Yep. Mm. Cool. So that's how it works. And then you have to do the, the math. It'll just give you a percentage. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the percentage means, um, but it's a number that you compare it to on uh, another spot. Hmm. Interesting. Um, expensive, but it does more than most. Yeah. And is, I'm sure, more accurate because the cheap ones are notoriously wrong. Yeah, and it was it was really important to me framing the house up in winter to make sure that it was dry before we started blowing in insulation. And what is the particular worry with the engineered studs? Uh, I had less of a worry about those. I just really wanted to know. Uh, they shouldn't soak up as much moisture. Uh, you know, they're wax coated in a way. They have some kind of film I mean, on but them. they start out as a slurry. So, I mean, right. at, some, yeah. at some point, they're freaking sopping wet, I'm sure. Yeah, they're mostly glue, probably. Uh, but still, I wanted to make sure that the inside of the uh, zip sheathing that I used was 
sufficiently dry and not holding on to any moisture that was going to get trapped in the wall. What was your wall assembly? Just so it's a double wall. Uh, so it's a two by six bearing wall on the outside, which I did in LSL studs because our eaves are 11 feet and the model code in Wisconsin stops at 10 feet. So either I would have had to have an engineer stamp framing plans or step it up to the engineered material. Those were the two options I had with my inspector. And then the inside is just a, a standard non-bearing two by material wall, two by four wall. Why we're talking about this, we got another uh, feedback question. I enjoyed hearing and reading about Ian's process so far. I don't recall if he mentioned in the podcast, but did you do smart framing at your wall slash doors windows? Uh, also on the frame, did you use any type of drywall gasket like the Dow drywall gasket, or did you rely only on the zip R for penetrations and exterior air sealing? I assume he's meaning smart framing, like, uh, or I think he's meaning framing. like OVE, like, uh, you know, trying to get out the, the extraneous, the extra uh, framing members, like, you know, doing away with jack studs, for example, or right sizing headers, or not using them in gable ends where you don't need them. Yeah, I did not. I kept it all pretty standard and just made the assumption that the thickness of the wall and the cellulose was going to make up for that uh, extra framing material. How about and the drywall gasket? I did not do that. Uh, so we we did zip sheathing going back into the window box, and then we just did drywall returns. So the, the drywall returns into the window. But the one thing that I did... Uh, was tape the inside of the window with uh, interior air sealing tape. And it's actually pre-bent, so it, it, you can easily put it at 90 degrees to tape the uh, face of the window to that zip sheathing buck. And that, that really did a, a great job of air sealing the windows. And then I used Ben Bogey's method of uh, the York uh, plastic flashing underneath the windows so that the bottom of the window isn't taped so that anything can um, drain back out into the drain plane from the bottom of the window. Who, who makes the pre-bent flashing tape or I got sealing it from, tape? I got it from Proclima. I think Sega makes one as well, uh, but the, the one that was easier for me to get online was Proclima from 475. Uh, one other feedback, and then we'll get on here. Uh, you've mentioned noise control on several podcasts lately, but haven't mentioned the big noise leak, the door. A few years ago, I built a sound-isolated room for an air compressor and dust collector using the usual uh, Rockwell spray foam hat channel, etc. I also put in an exterior door with no sh threshold and a Pemco automatic door bottom to seal it off. I skipped the threshold so I could roll equipment in and out easier. Lastly, foam and rock wool between the jams and rough opening. There's no point in doing all the insulation without sealing the air gaps around all four edges of the door. The cheaper doors filled with wood particles are better at isolation than a solid wood door. Well, that's great feedback, and he's totally right. It doesn't matter how good a job you do air sealing if the door is leaky, right? Just like air sealing. Yeah, and when <laughs> I checked out the link that that writer sent along, I instantly remembered having installed those in commercial uh, situations having to put the door seals on and the Can you uh, explain that, seal. Ian, to folks who aren't familiar with that? The ones that we would typically use look a, a lot like weather stripping, and these were all hollow core or hollow metal frames that these doors were in. Uh, so you would you would screw these gaskets onto the door stops of the hollow metal frame, and then the bottom of the door would get. Uh, a similar type gasket that would look a little bit like a sweep that you would put on a, uh, I guess on a storm door or screen door. He's talking about um, automatic door bottom, which is like put in a rabbit or a yep. groove in the, in the bottom of the door. And then yep. when you close it, it pushes it down. Yep. And the plus is that you don't have all this drag when you try and open the door and you don't have this threshold where you like this guy right. wanted to get equipment in and out of his room. And uh, that's a pain. So, cool. Thanks for that. Um, so, our first question. Christian in Austin, Texas. 
Hey, FHB crew, I just found your podcast and I'm loving every minute. I'm relatively new to building homes as a construction manager, but I've worked on them for years as a carpenter here in Austin. My project is a new build, just over 8,000 square feet of conditioned space and has only one visible story from the street. The lower floor is dug in 14 feet and daylights south facing in the back of the lot. Here is my question for the esteemed panel. I don't know which show he's listening to. <laughs> I have roughly uh, 18 by 30 of second floor exterior terrace that will be poured concrete over steel pan deck. I'd like to waterproof this area prior to pouring concrete. Post pour, this terrace will receive a waterproofing membrane. Polyguard is one example. This will be covered by a mud bed and three quarter inch stone. While waterproofing above the concrete is a worthwhile step, I have seen it fail. Water can get under this Polyguard product, cause it to delaminate, de and ultimately water will get into the concrete. The water banks in the concrete slab and gets, backs into the concrete slab and gets a vapor driven on hot days to bad places. While there is no living space under this terrace, there is a tongue and groove ceiling. I'd like to find a procedure or product that I can use to waterproof any corners, cracks, and poor stop transitions or penetration before the concrete is placed. Mm -hmm. I have asked around, and people usually just use expanding spray foam. There has to be a better way. <laughs> Thanks for everything. Christian. Well, Christian, that is a great question, one that I am not sure. I would say, ask Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I looked it up online polyguard does have some some tapes and some uh, reinforced liquid applied flashing type materials that i would think you could use for this i would say if you're already using polyguards products call your rep and say hey this what else do you have what do you have that i can use for this uh the corrugated metal decking is going to be really tough to, uh, to waterproof. But I did find another company online called Plydeck, P-L-I-D-E-K, uh, and they do have uh, distributors in, in Texas where uh, this writer is, so um, that would be another uh, So is that a that, waterproof decking? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so unlike the steel panels that we see in parking garages and right. stuff, those, those are never made to uh, no. hold water. They are meant <laughs> to hold to concrete. Shit. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't matter if water pours into the parking garage, right? But you right. don't want that through your tongue and groove wood ceiling. <laughs> yeah, I think you got to stick with a, a system here. You don't want to be mixing matching products. Yeah, it, it has to all work together, right? Yeah, and the, the commercial concrete world is such a bizarre place already to just start taking little bits and pieces from everywhere and plopping them together is really risky. The one plus you have, Christian, is that these details are worked out for commercial buildings. So I right. would say this is what you're looking to get help with. You know, this is you're, you've moved beyond residential work into the commercial realm, I would say. I hope you're charging enough. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on this? That seemed like a pretty straightforward answer. Thank you, Ian. Uh, this comes from Joseph. Since there's no such thing as solar cooling and solar cells have a carbon footprint estimated to be 10% of natural gas, but still not zero, is a net zero house possible in a cooling climate? And uh, Joseph links to a Forbes article, uh, Forbes article that I, I read this morning. Did you guys see this piece? Yep. It was comparing the uh, respective uh, carbon inputs with various ways of generating power. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It's hard to know if they considered everything in these uh, metrics, but um, what do you think? Can you make a net zero house in a cooling climate? Well, it gets to what the definition of net zero is. I think that article was talking about carbon neutrality uh, instead of net zero, where the definition of net zero is you make enough energy on site with renewables to cover your use, uh, which is why a lot of places advocate that if you're going to use a HERS rater, you get the house down to about hers 30 and then you PV the rest because that's like the, uh, <laughs> the, the best cost benefit uh, yeah. ratio, right? Once you right. go below hers, hers 30, it's, it's getting really, more expensive, really expensive, right? It's yeah. like passive house at that point, which is, you know, why I did more of the pretty good house style. You mm -hmm. know, I would have had to have done a lot more insulating in my roof system and I would have had to have spent four X on windows. Um, which for me was a non-starter. 
I think that if, if we're talking net zero, yeah, you can. It's pretty easy, especially in places right. where it's sunny, uh, even right. if they're hot, because you have tons of, you know, PV generation. And, um, you know, I guess a bigger question is like, is that carbon neutral? And my guess is right. probably not. <laughs> yeah, I, I would argue that most of what we do is not carbon neutral. I think getting anything in the building science realm to be carbon neutral. I know there's a lot of people like Chris Magwood and uh, uh, Jacob Rasmussen at uh, New Frameworks that are working really hard to find ways to do it. And we'll, we'll get there eventually, but you know, so much of this advanced technology stuff with, uh, with building science and trying to get carbon neutrality and net zero, it's making big jumps over standard homes and over those uh, old energy pig type homes we were just talking about earlier. It's all part of the same conversation, which is kind of yeah. why I led with that, uh, yep. you know, article from the Atlantic. What do you think yeah. about this, Colin? Is it is it even worth doing? Should we be trying to be net zero or carbon neutral? Can we? Well, I think it's like Passive House. At a certain point, maybe it's you're going too far for a little bit of gain. Aren't we a carbon-based species? So maybe it's Maybe we should have a little carbon in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking the heat off of my little house statement there. With that. <laughs> um, you know, and I don't know, kind of like do your best, right? I, I, I think yeah. there are people who are pushing the envelope, and I think that's great. Um, commercial buildings are what really need to be addressed. Yeah. I think but we should start from building smaller houses, uh, for starters, like who the heck needs three or 4,000 square feet? I mean, honestly, it's just you, more cleaning. <laughs> you should have tried to be there to tell my wife that. So we, we settled at 27 cause you know, that was a happy medium apparently. Uh, does that seem like too much to you now? A little bit, but only a little bit. It, mm -hmm. it we lived in such small places and in, in the Northeast that it's nice to have that amount of room, but it's Did you have to buy more furniture? I bet you did. Uh, uh, we haven't really bought anything more yet. It's you know, a lot of finally making use of what we had more than uh, buying more. But the one point I wanted to make about net zero is I think on the marketing end of it, they're really missing an opportunity to show people that you can spend a little bit of money on PV now, uh, but after eight or nine years of paying for it, you're going to have free electricity. I mean, that's that's a big part of why I'm going to do it with uh, my EV car that I drive to work and uh, the electric heat with the mini splits. Our are, are bill's like 240 a month. But if I can offset that by PV and even get a, a loan for that at less than that 240, your money ahead right away. And after eight or nine years, that that's 240 bucks a month of free power for at least another 10 years while the life of the PV holds up. Do you have any response to folks who uh, object to the aesthetics of PV panels on their roof? Yeah, they're ugly as hell, but, you know, what, <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Uh, like asphalt I disagree. Or I don't. I don't think they're ugly. I think they're they're beauty because you like. I see clean energy up there. Is what I see when I look at those. I think it's something you get over. Uh, we, we have wind towers by us, and I can see them from my house. And people complain about them, and it's like you don't even notice that they're there. Yeah, they're ugly if you want to sit and stare at them, but <laughs> it blends into the background pretty quick. I got to think PV is the same way. Well, it is a good question, Joseph, and thank you for listening. Thank you for writing in. And if you live in a hot place uh, with PV, it's pretty easy to get net zero. Uh, this comes from Andrew and Nita Mass. Dear FHB podcast, I have a tip that may be helpful to some listeners. I've used degree days to quantify improvements I've made to my house. If you're unfamiliar, a degree day is a measure of how hot or cold it is in a particular location. Degree days are posted on the internet and easy to find. You can track your oil and gas consumption and compare these values against the number of degree days during that period. For my particular project, I air sealed and added insulation to my attic. Then I compared the number of degree days in a heating season to my total consumption of oil. 
After the project was completed, my K factor, degrees, which is degree day divided by consumption, in my case, gallons of oil, increased from seven to 12. I'll admit this isn't a perfect method. There are lifestyle factors that may skew the results. For example, you may use more heat during a particular winter compared to previous years due to simply being home more, i.e. the pandemic. But all in all, if, you already cons- if you're already if you relatively consistent with your thermostat, this method can show you the direct impact from your air sealing and insulation efforts. Andrew. Uh, degree days, yeah. It's on your uh, electric bill too, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. And in most energy models, it uh, takes degree days into account. Do, you, do we know what the degree we're comparing to is in heating and cooling, anyone? Um, I think it's like taking 70 degrees and heating and probably 75 and cooling, but it's how much, uh, you know, the ambient temperature varies from, from your, uh, you know, ideal temperature indoor setting. temperature, right? Yeah. That's my understanding of it. Uh, but I think since this guy's in Needham, you got to drive up there and do a blower door on his, on his house. We so haven't that, done that for a while, and, so and, the, he and can, the, he can really Jeff know is still what he did. at the top of the leaderboard, which makes me a little <laughs> uncomfortable because you know his house is much bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know how many uh, degree days we had in December, Colin? I have no idea. I'm I have not no good idea with math. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good way to compare how things uh, change uh, year to year uh, with kind of a consistent baseline for comparison. Like, oh, yeah, we used all uh, so much more heat this January, but uh, it's because it was much colder, right? Or uh, we used a lot more electricity this July compared to last, but it's because it was 100 degrees instead of 80. So it kind of balances those things out. I think what it does is it focuses you on your thermostat setting and makes that as the constant, because that's what you experience in your house, right? Keeping it at 70 or 75 and and telling you what you need in energy to be able to maintain that. Your house must be cheap to run, because I know I'm not not keeping mine at 75, I can say that. Uh, 75 sounds, really, 75? (laughs) I was saying for cooling. Oh, for cooling, yeah, yeah, Yeah. dig it. Yeah. Oh, cooling about 68. Uh, Jeff, I would describe you as somewhat as a numbers guy. Do you pay attention to this uh, uh, this uh, measurement? Not directly, no. I mean, I, I kind of look at the compare year over year, you know, on electric bills and oil bills and things like that. But I don't dig that deeply. I probably should because I noticed that I used like 13 or 14 percent more electricity uh, this January versus or December versus last, I just got my December bill. And I was kind of surprised by that. It didn't seem uh, colder, and I certainly didn't feel warmer. Uh, so I don't know what the disconnect is there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a full year in our house so that I can compare you know, year to year. Uh, I think I was telling you, Patrick, we had 27 below here last week and uh when that I makes got me up, laugh because i don't even know what i would do <laughs> it's, that, that's that's cold uh, so tell cold. me about your electric car in those temperatures like Terrible. they are noto- notorious Terrible. for being cold anyway cold as yeah. in like they don't have good heat yes correct yeah that's why my wife won't drive it um uh, yeah the i have a chevy volt so it's the it's battery and then it it has a gas uh motor that it kicks over to but but it's tiny uh, it's what a liter as yeah, i recall it's, yeah it's like nothing which, which is fine because i'm i'm driving about 110 miles round trip uh to get to the office four days a week uh, but in when it's warm it gets about 35 to 40 miles on the battery and when it's cold sometimes it's too cold for even the battery to run so then the motor runs anyways uh, but I'll, I'll average about 15 to 20. Uh, and then there's another guy here at TDS who has a, a Chevy Bolt. And he told me the other day that... And that one's uh, all electric, we should tell all, folks. In all case, electric. Yeah. Uh, during the summer, he would get about 200 miles to the charge. And during the winter now, he's barely getting 100, which um, he's got not quite that in round trip, but he said it gets a little nerve wracking uh, driving at home. So... He ends up taking the charger here at the office in the afternoon. 
to top it off on cold days. Do you guys have a level one, two, or three charger? It's a level two charger, so I can charge my Volt in uh, about three and a half or four hours, which is what I have at home as well. And we should tell folks once again, that's an inductive charger that's 240. Uh, yep. Class one is just like your normal 115 outlet. Yeah. Um, and then there's three, which is even faster. And then, of course, Tesla has their own because that's what they do. Right, which you have to, to my knowledge, you have to watch out on some of the level three ones that are speculating that's uh, some of the problems they're having with electric cars burning garages down because they're uh, level three chargers may not be compatible with certain uh, cars. batteries that they're trying mm -hmm. to charge. Hey, can you guys educate me a little on why exactly they're not performing in the cold? Is it because some of the power is going towards heating or is it because just the performance in cold? I think it's just the performance of the lithium in, in cold. It's no different than cordless you know, drills or saws when you're using them outside. They they don't last nearly as long. I I used to have a lot of the Milwaukee and DeWalt stuff, and during the summer you could pretty much use a cordless skill saw until lunch or even middle of the afternoon on one battery, and then you get down into the winter, and it's like you got to have a fleet of them charged and ready all the time. It is uh, running the heat, too, because uh, as I was talking to Elizabeth DeSalvo, who's an architect in the Greenwich mm -hmm. area, she has a leaf. And it has a heat pump in it to make heat in the yeah. wintertime because it doesn't have heat as a byproduct of combustion. So, like, she's got way less battery range uh, in the winter when she's running the heat. And she was, like, wearing her uh, toboggan and her yeah. down coat in the car, right, because she didn't want to run the heat because then she wouldn't be able to get home. <laughs> yeah, the first cold day that I drove my, my Volt, I spent, like, most of the drive going, why – how do I turn the heat on in this car? Like, what's going on? And I went on some owner forums, and one guy was just like, winter hat, down coat, driving gloves. That's your heat. It's just like driving a Volkswagen Beetle back in, yeah. the, in the late 60s, right? Yeah. Yeah, without uh, the smell. Right. <laughs> but the other thing with my minus 27 was our uh, Mitsubishi uh, multi-split system was still kicking out heat when I left the house in the morning. So I thought that was was pretty impressive that I could put my hand in front of it and feel warm air. And I have a, an app that follows my uh, thermostat for the boiler. And when it dropped to the 27 below that night, the boiler only ran for three extra hours beyond what we uh, have set as our uh, schedule for it to run. So I thought that was pretty impressive. And uh, I checked our gas gauge on our tank and we've we've used about i think it's a gallon or a gallon and a quarter of propane a day uh keeping the house warm and hot water and cooking so that's it, that is crazy cool uh pretty, good pretty for happy you with that good I, for you i told my parents that who have propane uh boiler heat as well and i think my mom was like i think we use like 50 times that <laughs> i'm surprised they believed you at all they're like that's impossible right because yeah. like, well, that, the whole idea of building this house was about energy efficiency and building something for the long term. So uh, when I got called out as a nutcase for a lot of what I was doing and spending <laughs> money on, I had to be right there. With, but it's going to save me so much money later. Yeah. And I think propane is, what, about three bucks a gallon the last I heard. Uh, it's it, expensive it is, fuel. But, it is, but I'm on a long-term contract, and I think we paid a buck twenty-five. Uh for the fill up that we got on. Uh, you should try and like start Eve. stockpiling that. You should buy like a thousand uh, tanks and have your own little commodities uh, uh, enterprise there. Yeah. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Anything uh, anyone has to offer before we go? Uh, I just wanted to direct people to the Fine Home Building House Wisconsin blog. Jess just posted the uh, cost breakdown for the house that we talked about on the podcast. So if you want to see it written out and in front of you so that you can critique my lack of opportunity cost, it's uh, <laughs> up there in, in print now. I was surprised 50K in lumber. I mean, houses are mostly lumber, but that was that seemed like a lot. I, I, you, could, you can tell that things were not normal, uh, I would say. Water trust is at, at I believe, the peak. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, we had 7,000-something in trusses alone, and 
I think one of the things that really killed me was uh, the cost of structural grade 2x12 and 2x10 material for my rafters. It was uh, like, when I bought 2 by they were like $35 a piece. Uh, it was yeah. insane. Yeah. Do you and remember what you paid for I, those? I want to say it was in that low 30s because yeah. they were they were to the point where I think I resawed a bunch of them up into 2 by 4s later on because I was just like, sure. the, the cost of the 2 by 4s had gone up to like 12 bucks, And I was thinking <laughs> like, well, I can get three of those out of a 2 by 12 and I paid 32 for them. So I'm money ahead. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, I want to thank all of you for listening. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to all of uh, our guests. And please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Graph alive. Happy building. And thank you very much for listening. Bye.